Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Tech Trends webinar series. My name is Trevor Henderson, Technology Editor for Lab Manager, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, which will focus on automated liquid handling solutions for your lab. Today we have a panel consisting of four leading industry specialists who will share their insights into the pros and cons of various automated liquid handling systems and how they can be effectively integrated into your laboratory's workflow. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to send us your questions at any point during the presentation, and the panelists will address these during the question and answer session following the discussion. To ask questions, simply type your query into the question box located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as possible during the Q&A session. However, if we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to the panelists, and they can respond to you directly. Additional resources can be accessed through the resource widget located at the bottom of your screen. You may also move or resize any of the windows simply by grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right corner. You may need to move or minimize some of the open windows at this time to see the live view. This webinar recording will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website. At the end of this webinar, we'll share that link with you as well as the contact information for all of our panelists. With that, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Paul Held joined Biotech in 1993 as a research scientist and is currently the Application Laboratory Manager. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacology from Albany College of Pharmacy and also holds a Master's of Science degree in Pathology and Molecular Biology and a PhD in Molecular Biology from the Albany Medical College. Thank you for joining us today, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Trevor, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending the, the webinar. and. Uh, so as Trevor said, uh, I'm the Applications Lab Manager for Biotech Instruments. We are a manufacturer of uh, microplate instrumentation. And what I'd like to talk about today is, uh, is really automated liquid handling in low density plates. Uh, and I'm going to use as an example uh, automated cell fixation and staining. So the, the question is in terms of automation, there's always degrees of scale. And uh, particularly at the low and medium uh, scales where really components are involved uh, or components and stackers uh, and in some cases liquid handlers really what those um, types of automation try to address are specific pain points within the, the uh, assay process the high throughput scale stuff uh, is more interested in uh, just moving large numbers of samples whereas the low, low scale uh, automation really uh, is evolved around uh, addressing pain points um, from the manual uh, methods of uh, operating the whatever process you're trying to deal with. And as I said today, uh, really uh, what I want to talk about today is our low density plates. So this would really be considered um, uh, low on the automation scale, but, but, in, in, a, but in, in a sense, um, despite it being low um, uh, throughput, uh, there really still are pain points that need to be addressed. So in terms of automation, not surprisingly, uh, really what we're looking at trying to uh, achieve is uh, relief from repetitive tasks. And in this instance, there'd be uh, issues such as multiple washes or numerous reagent additions. And as uh, automation in general brings about uh, a certain amount of consistency and traceability uh, that normally isn't present with uh, manual methods of uh, operation. Uh, and in a, in some sense, I'd like to address the, the common misconception that low-density plates really don't require automation, but in fact, in many instances, they do. So what do we mean by low-density plates? Really what we're talking about are 6, 12, 24, and 48-well microplates uh, as compared to traditional 96 and 3D4-well plates. These plates are, the, the low-density plates are more commonly used for tissue culture-based experiments, and in particular, um, uh, in this instance that I'm trying to de will describe is really what we're looking at is uh, some sort of microscopy event. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they are uh, lower uh, uh, well numbers than the traditional 96 and 3D4 well plates. So in terms of cell fixation and staining, really what the reason uh, that what is driving this really is the, is the advent of more and more fluorescence microscopy uh, in today's research. Um, for a period of time, there a certain amount of high content analysis has been based um, on screening, uh, and then we've got a certain amount of high content assay development. 
But more and more academic labs are becoming involved with high content analysis uh, through mic uh, microscopy. And kind of the mainstay of uh, plates in terms of, in terms of this uh, technique in academic labs tends to be 24 roll plates. Uh, and then in certain uh, instances, the use of cover slips and slides as well. So nevertheless, these are all throughput at low throughput assays that in many, many cases could really use automation. So because these are in, in essence uh, cell-based assays, there's a uh, certain background that we need, really need to talk about in terms of cell washing, uh, which is a, a mainstay in, in, in the procedure. And one of the concerns with, or one of the issues with cell washing is the fact that they, in many instances or many cases, can be tricky to wash. And the reason being is, is if one uses a kind of a standard approach to washing from, taken from ELISAs where uh, fluids uh, injected into the wells at high rates of speeds, uh, straight into the center of the well. Oftentimes, areas of the well will become denuded of the uh, cells that are of interest, uh, particularly the center region of the well, which is where most commonly used for uh, imaging. Whereas it, if one takes the approach of using um, a not a, a vigorous dispensive fluid and use an angled uh, tubes and, and uh, angle that towards the side of the well, one oftentimes will re, uh, achieve better results. Um, so in terms of basics, so this is an example of, of, of taking care of, uh, uh, of dispensing versus uh, uh, using a traditional ELISA dispense. The pictures on the left really show the effects of uh, cell being denuded from the plate using a uh, vigorous vertical dispense, whereas the cells on the, on the right really show um, how cells can be maintained on, on the bottom of a microplate uh, with appropriate uh, fluid dispenses. And the reason being is that we really have two things going on. One is aspiration, where there's a serious vortex surrounding the aspiration tube, uh, so care really needs to be taken in, in terms of minimizing the amount of uh, time that cells on the bottom of the plate are exposed to this vortex. And really what we want to do is use rapid uh, mechanical movements to aspirate the fluid um, without uh, uh, damaging the cells. And in addition, really what you want to do is leave behind some residual fluid that not only keeps the aspiration tubes away from the cells, but also in the dispense step, which you see next, uh, you will see that this residual fluid serves as a buffer for uh, incoming fluids. Uh, oftentimes what we, we've noticed is that the dispense step is actually the, um, the problem as compared to the aspiration where rapid fluid dispenses will denude uh, areas of the well. So if we can use a rapid mechanical movement um, to remove fluid as well as low dispense rates it, along with angled tubes pointing towards the, at the uh, side of the well, we can minimize the effect of uh, fluid dynamics uh, on the cells of interest. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, fluorescence microscopy has become uh, more and more important in terms of um, today's research uh, with the advent of a number of fluorescent stains, uh, fluorescently labeled antibodies, primarily secondary antibodies uh, directed to uh, specific monoclonal primaries, and um, the use of a, new, a number of different inherently fluorescent proteins. Um, cell proteins can be uh, localized uh, and quantitated within cells based on microscopy. And the image on the left really shows uh, nuclear staining with a Hoechst dye, uh, microtubules that were stained with a, a GFP label, and actin films that were saved with an RFP label. So really we have multiple color fluorescence imaging uh, in microplates today. So in terms of fixing and staining tissue culture cells, really the question is, is why, what is the reason for doing this? Uh, in essence, fixation freezes cells in place. Uh, it will preserve the spatial relationship of organelles within the cells and the, and the proteins um, um, it, surrounding those organelles. and allows for imaging to take place at one's convenience. Um, many times, uh, live cell assays um, can be accomplished but there are a number of instances where one cannot actually image live cells, and they really need to fix and stain cells, uh, primarily when there's an antibody-based fluorescence detection, which uh, as antibodies require uh, membrane permeabilization, which is 
um, not amenable with uh, live cells. So if we can fix and stain the cells, uh, we can treat them with antibodies. We can then image them at, at our one's leisure, uh, allowing for batch imaging. So the kind of flow diagram on the right really indicates uh, kind of the multi-step process required for fixing and staining. There's, in essence, six or seven uh, fluid addition or reagent additions interspersed with multiple wash steps in between. So one can imagine with all these numbers of steps that need to take place with the addition of antibodies, the secondary antibody stains, uh, as well as fixation, that even a six-well plate would require numerous um, fluid interventions to do, to do it manually. And being able to automate these tasks would make l life easier for um, the researcher, as well as provide a, probably a more consistent product day to day uh, in terms of the uh, final product. Uh, the instrument that I really want to talk about today is a Multiflow FX. Um, it's a, a washer dispenser manufactured by Biotech. Um, it has the capabilities of, of dispensing to anywhere from 6 well up to 15, 36 well plates. Um, it has two peristaltic pumps for reagent addition. It also has two syringe pumps for, for uh, reagent addition, as well as a, a plate washing module. So in essence, we have the ability to add five different reagents without any kind of uh, intervention or changing of, of reagents, uh, along with a, an aspiration manifold. So I'm going to use this uh, device really to accomplish um, fixing and staining of uh, cells in uh, low-density plates. So as one can imagine, uh, low-density plates present their own challenges, and the, the first of which is you know, each d dense density of plates has a different uh, geometric configuration. Uh, what's important in terms of aspiration of fluids uh, within wells is that the, the manifold is correctly positioned. Um, the manifold in the, the multi-flow, in essence, has one aspiration tube for each uh, well, uh, basically based on the short, the short geometry of the plate. As you can see, the kind of the little red dots indicate where the aspiration tubes will be located. And for best results, really, what you want to do is locate your aspiration tubes to one edge of the well, and, and then, nevertheless, needless to say, um, different aspiration manifolds are required for different um, plate. Uh, geometries. A 12 wall plate would re require a manifold with three aspiration tubes, whereas a 48 well plate would re want, require one with six aspiration tubes. But regardless, there's one, tube, one aspiration tube per well at, at any one time. Likewise, the dispense manifold for washing, where you're going to add reagents, um, uses, uh, it needs to be positioned um, adjacent to the edge of the well as well, and we use angle tubes to direct the fluid flow into the edge of the well, dissipating much of the, the fluid energies um, before it, hit, it actually uh, hits the cells themselves. Uh, likewise, uh, we, the, the syringe pump dispenser manifolds are independent of both the washer as well as the peri pump, and last but not least, the peri pump um, is independent as well. So we've got different manifolds uh, for the different uh, the dispensers. Each one can in act independently of one another. And in each case, it, when you utilize that, you really want to make sure that, that the positioning of those uh, tubes is located on one edge of the well. Uh, likewise, uh, the manifolds um, for each plate type are different. Uh, and two things to note are one is each uh, it, Unlike the aspiration tubes, the manifolds here actually have multiple tubes. Uh, they're actually relatively small diameter tubes, and this allows for accurate volume control. Uh, but note that the, the clusters of tubes are spaced appropriately for different um, well ge uh, plate geometries, uh, the idea being that uh, by clustering them close together, one can move the manifold closer to one edge uh, as compared to spreading them out. And because the manifolds have roughly the same number of tubes, uh, regardless of the um, plate type, uh, fluid dynamics um, need not really be changed much from switching from, a, say, a six-well manifold to a 48-well manifold. The same fluid rates can be used uh, 
despite switching manifolds and switching plate types. Uh, and this is just, just an example of some of the three color staining we've done with um, a six wall plate. This is actually a NH223 cell stained with uh, a nuclear stain. Uh, they've got GF GFP in the cytoplasm, and they also, we've stained them with Texas Red Floyd. So this is just an example of th what the capabilities of staining with, uh, with, you know, fixing and staining along with the washing steps uh, with in a six wall plate. Uh, but nevertheless, things are not necessarily perfect. Uh, the, the image I showed you before looked really nice. Uh, but if you look at a montage of an entire well, uh, this is actually, I think, a 14 by 15 montage where a number of images were taking place. Uh, the, the blue arrow kind of indicates an area of uh, damage. And if you actually you zoom in on it, you can see that there's actually a small area that actually has been denuded from the, from the well. And this is actually where the, aspirate, the single aspiration tube uh, impacted the, the uh, well bottom, uh, but nevertheless, it really represents a really small portion of the total well, and actually less than one half of one percent. Uh, so, really, what this means is, despite this area of damage, the vast majority of the well um, is completely intact and can be used for imaging. Uh, another thing that a, a number of people have used uh, in low density plates are cover slips. Uh, cover slips are often cultured in either uh, petri dishes or in this case uh, six wall plates and as you can see from the cartoon you can actually place a number of cover slips uh, in these six wall plates. Uh, the the uh, cover slips have cells seated on them, uh, they're fixed in stain and then the cover slip is then uh, attached to a microscope slide prior to imaging. But nevertheless this is the way to process six different cover slips uh, on one plate, and you can certainly automate the task. Uh, once the cover slips are in the plate, uh, the procedure is exactly the same as if they were uh, cultured in the plate themselves. Uh, and this is just an image of uh, a, a cover slip that we actually uh, put in a well and, and seated. Uh, what we've done here is two things. One, we had a round cover slip, and the bright round circle that you see is actually the cover slip with cells on them. Um, and there's actually an area, a halo area where we actually moved the cover slip from, and you can see where it was originally. Um, the other thing you can see to the far right of the uh, well is a little area uh, that was denuded by the aspiration tube. But nevertheless, we can fix and stain these cover slips in the well, and then after the fact, remove the cover slip, put it on a microscope slide, um, and image it on the slide. Uh, this image here is just uh, another example of a cover slip, and as you can see in the 2.5x image on the left, uh, really what you're looking at is the uh, edge of a cover slip. The, the region to the left of that uh, um, image is uh, cells on the cover slip, uh, and, the, and the, the region kind of to the right of that arrow uh, are cells on the, the, the uh, plate itself, and as you can see, they're somewhat out of focus as we've imaged on the cover slip itself. And the 10x image on the right is essentially just um, a, a higher magnification area of the area that's indicated by the circle. Uh, so to conclude what I've really talked about, I mean, I, I want to think I, I've tried to emphasize that low density plates uh, are they're certainly a commonly used format, particularly in the academic world, uh, and they they are certainly amenable to automation in terms of fluid handling now, uh, and Despite their low well number, um, there are many assays, particularly fixing and staining cells, where numerous reagent additions and wash steps are involved uh, in the, these, making these low density plates uh, um, uh, kind of a, 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 a real need to, to automate. Uh, and hopefully I've kind of shown that the multi-flow FX that we um, uh, manufacturer uh, is capable of these reagent additions and wash steps uh, to automate uh, low density plate uh, uh, fluid handlings. And, and uh, we've got a number of uh, application notes on our website. You can certainly visit that. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, attendance. And, uh, and hopefully, I'll answer some questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thank you all for sending in your questions. I encourage you to continue to do this throughout the presentations. If you are joining us late, you can simply ask questions by typing your query into the question box, which is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. 
Our next speaker today is Kasia Proctor, who joins us from Agilent Technologies. Kasia is responsible for managing multiple automation product lines at Agilent. She has a Master's of Science in Biomedical Engineering from California State University, and she's been the life science, in the life science industry for almost 10 years now. Kasia joined Agilent at the beginning of this year. Prior to that, she's been working with plate readers and their various applications, including integrating with automation equipment. Thanks for joining us today, Kasia. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, and thanks, Paul. Um, so, um, as Trevor mentioned, my name is Kasia Proctor, and I'm a senior product manager with the Agilent Technologies. I would like to talk to you today about things to consider when you are planning to automate your liquid handling steps. There's a couple of different reasons why customers would uh, want to automate. As Paul mentioned, even for the lower throughput, uh, a lot of times customers will want to automate to reduce the variability in their data. We definitely see that a lot uh, with some of our customers as well, really wanting to tighten up their um, CVs. Uh, also, a lot of times for the higher throughput, um, customers would want to increase the throughput or increase their walk-away time um, to free up the uh, lab technicians to do other things or the scientists. So kind of regardless of, of the reasons why we're automating, there's a couple of things that you would want to look at um, uh, for the instrumentation. Uh, first would be the performance, and I'll, I'll talk about kind of each aspect um, in a little bit more depth as we go through the slides. Um, the ease of use of the instrumentation, instrument flexibility, and then finally the cost uh, of the whole system. So really, when you're talking about the performance, um, the performance of the liquid handling uh, really uh, is the same as the pipetting accuracy uh, of your system. Here I'm showing you um, a couple different examples from our instrumentation that we have. Um, and the, the thing to consider is the publish uh, specifications uh, are one thing, and then what you can actually achieve is another. In some cases, like with uh, Agilent's uh, Bravo system or the on-call multi-span, uh, you can see that the systems outperform the published specifications. Uh, so in both cases, um, we uh, guarantee 5% CVs, but you can see that uh, um, with the various tip sizes and uh, different volumes, we actually get better performance than the published specification. So as you're evaluating the different systems out there, you want to uh, obviously look at the published specs, but also consider what, what, is, uh, what can you really expect to get in your lab. The other aspect that I mentioned would be the ease of use. When you're thinking about the ease of use, uh, really software is the main interface uh, with the instrument. Uh, so you really want to focus on how, um, how the software works and what can you do in it. If you are an automation engineer, and I think we have a few on the call based on the, the people that wrote the list of the registrants that I saw, um, you might want to look into the details of as you're writing out the protocol, what, are the, what is the flexibility between each step, exactly how can you set it up, how can you optimize the system, and um, you would really be an expert in the liquid handling, and, and you want to make sure that there's enough flexibility in the system for you to adjust it. But for all the other users, uh, that you really want to make sure that it's easy to walk up to the system and use it, and that there's um, a user-friendly software that allows you to, um, to be less experienced in the liquid handling, uh, um, but yet still be able to, to run with it and still be able to use it. So in our case, um, both for the software for our um, Bravo system and the uh, Encore system, and I'll talk more about the systems themselves later, um, but in either case, we have these forms that allow you to provide a user interface that really simplifies the protocol. And we have a number of pre-written protocols that have these forms available where you uh, would just enter the volumes and the number of samples, and, uh, and it's allows uh, you to have a much simpler interface. So um, whether you, if you're not an expert and you just want to have a system that's in your lab, but you, you, know, you have a lot of um, scientists that will be using it, that's a great way to go. 
or even if you are an automation engineer, uh, but you know that you will be providing protocols for other people in the lab to be using, then this is also a great way for you to uh, provide an easy-to-use protocol for them um, so it can benefit um, customers in either case. The other thing to consider as part of the ease of use is when you are uh, programming a new uh, protocol. In our case, we offer a 3D simulation of the system. So it really allows you to see what your protocol will do. Um, you, can, you can have a full model. You can see your labware on the deck. Um, you are able to um, you lay out everything in the software itself, and you can simulate this remotely. So you can really check on your computer as you're writing it uh, what's going to happen. You can see each exact move. You can, if your protocol is very long, you can actually speed it up so it runs faster. Um, and you don't have to do all this testing in front of an instrument with an actual hardware in front of you. So that really saves a lot of time, uh, in particular, again, when you're writing new protocols. So it's a great feature that I think was, comes in very handy to our users. Uh, so that's something that you should um, think about as, uh, as you're looking at the different systems out there. The next step that I think is important to um, evaluate when you're looking at automating uh, liquid handling steps in your lab uh, would be the instrument flexibility. So you're most likely buying an instrument for a specific assay. You have specific tests that you plan to run with it. Uh, but it is an investment in a way, and so you want to make sure that in the future, say a year from now, if things change, there's flexibility in the system to allow you to, to use that piece of uh, equipment uh, for additional tasks. Uh, so in our Bravo system, for example, uh, this shows you the, the hardware flexibility of we have a full pipetter head uh, where you can have a 96 pipetter head and you can use that for what you call plate stamping when you would transfer from one 96 plate to another 96 plate. But you can also use just a few rows or columns um, or just single tip on the, on the right bottom image there. Uh, so it really allows you to have more flexibility if you're trying to do a dilution series, if you're just trying to move a few samples um, from one plate to another, then um, you have that flexibility with the system. You get a greater flexibility with our uh, Encore multi-span um, system, and that offers, uh, that's the only uh, instrument with the multi-span capability. You can see in the animation that we have here, it allows you to spread the pipetters in the y-axis, and then you can also see them separate in the x-axis. So really, um, that means that um, if you're doing hit picking, if you're reformatting your plate, uh, if you're doing what you call pulling, where you put a, a bunch of samples into one well, uh, we are able to do that uh, quicker because uh, the pipetters are able to separate and then come together depending on your protocol, and they're able to pick um, from different columns or even different plates. Um, here I have a short video uh, showing you the benefits of the multi-span pipetting and just to, to kind of help understand. The orange and green represent the two different gantries, what we call. You can see they can come together or separate. For other systems um, that might have the variable span, they're able to only separate in the y-axis, and that leaves you with more steps. So basically, you, you get um, savings in your steps in your protocol when you're running uh, with the multi-span system. And then the last thing that I had on the list to consider would be the cost. And the cost really has to do with, uh, with what kind of system you're, you're looking at. So we have standalone systems, uh, such as our Bravo. Uh, that is a fairly compact system. Um, it's a benchtop system. Um, it has some flexibility in it, as we discussed. It has a, a gripper on there that is able to move the plates around on the deck. Uh, but it's, it's a fairly um, compact system that, uh, in, in this case, is not integrated with other um, devices. We have a kind of a more complex um, standalone option. Uh, sorry, my slide here is not advancing, so let's try it again. 
Um, oh, also for the uh, for the Bravo itself, we have another option that's specific to uh, certain assays. So for protein sample preparation, we also offer a, a different version of the Bravo, which is an assay map Bravo, and that has a different head on it, and that's already built in for, or in particular for protein sample preparation. It's, it has unique um, uh, tips on it that have filters built in, and it can um, it you know, very uh, specific to the um, assays that you would be running. So that's also um, available. Um, another standalone instrument that's a little bit more complex would then be the Encore, uh, which is easier to integrate because it has a built-in robotic arm on there. Uh, so it has the multi-spin capability that I've already uh, mentioned to you guys. Um, and the, the arm is there to help move plates on the deck, but it can also reach off the deck. And that comes in handy if you're trying to build a bigger system. This is in particular for customers that are really trying to increase their walkaway time. Um, so as you're, you know, if the walkaway time is important to you, then you would be looking at integrating more systems, and then naturally that gets more expensive because it's a, it's a bigger, more complex system. Um, so we'll, when we have a, a more complex system like that that's integrating multiple instruments, we call that a workstation. Uh, and we offer a number of uh, pre-configured workstations that are already set up for customers. In this case, these are built for specifically for NGS customers. We have a couple different options. That means that we already know which accessories they will be needing, and so it's, it's just simpler um, buying process because um, we can recommend to them this is what we know customers use. They have pre-written protocols with the forms that I was showing earlier. Um, and depending on the, on the throughput requirement and depending again on the walkaway time, you would either go with, with a simpler version on the left with NGS option A, or you have the option to go with a workstation with NGS option B that has basically uh, more capability to hold more plates, more tips um, in there. And then uh, for a true walkaway uh, solution, you can integrate. Uh, Encore in this case is shown with the, um, a plate reader uh, on the left, um, a Bravo for uh, full plate stamping capabilities, and also a multi-drop for quick reagent dispensing. So if you really are trying to set up a, a fairly complex protocol but that you can just push a button and walk away, then uh, a system similar to that might be what you want to consider. Um, again, then you know the costs naturally go up because it, you're including a lot more uh, instrumentation on there. So just to reiterate, the main things that I've uh, talked about uh, were the performance of the instrument, um, the ease of use of the system, um, instrument flexibility, something to think about for the future. You know, what can you do today for your assays and what flexibility you'll have later on, and then the cost, depending kind of also obviously tied into the um, complexity of the system. So um, that completes my presentation. Thank you all. Uh, I encourage you to um, check out some of the uh, links uh, that we posted on the uh, resource uh, site. Um, there are some more videos showing you uh, how the system works Getting you know, getting you familiar with uh, with what's available, and I'll take the questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kasha. And just a reminder that this video will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website. If you'd like a copy of the presenter's slides, we suggest that you reach out to them individually via email. Their contact information will be available at the end of the presentation. Our next speaker of the day is Hal Werenberg, who joins us from TCAN. Hal has worked with Tekin for nine years. He has been in Switzerland as a software product manager for four years and is primarily responsible for touch tools and next generation software. Uh, prior to that, he worked for Tekin US as a Chicago-based field engineer and traveled all of North America helping customers adopt automa automation, mentoring engineers in advanced Tekin automation options, and implementing a wide range of applications on Tekin platforms. Thank you for joining us today, Hal. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Um, 
very excited to kind of talk to everyone who's attending the webinar and thank you all for your attention. Um, the first thing I want to start with is just kind of show the open platforms that we have to work with. So if you're considering automation and what types of practical considerations you make, one of the first things that you need to really consider is what types of hardware you want to work with. What are your assay needs and what do you need to accomplish those? So to start that off, we have our Freedom Evo 75. This is the smallest of our open platform offerings. Um, but even though it's small, 75 is actually the approximate width, 75 centimeters. For those of you in America, that's uh, about two and a half feet wide. Um, You'll see here there's actually a lot of options. There's a liquid handling arm on the left. There's a robotic gripper arm for moving plates around. It can actually take plates to there's a reader on the right, a washer on the right. There's an incubating option in the back. Um, so you can actually do a lot of assays with just a small thing like this. And all of these options are also configurable. Um, Moving up in the range of flexibility, we have our EVO 100 to 200 platforms. And again, these uh, are giving you the approximate widths. Um, here you'll see there's a couple more arms. We can actually do three arms at a time. There's the gripper arm on the left in this particular one. We have a flexible channel arm in the middle. Uh, and that's, again, something really good at going from tube to plate. Those tips can spread out. They can move up and down independently. And it can come with one, two, four, or eight tips. We even have the ability of putting two of those on a single system. So you could actually have two arms with eight tips hip picking at the same time. And because it's so light and dedicated to those functions, it also moves rather quickly. And then the next arm is uh, available only on the 100 to 200 platforms. Uh, this is the multiple channel arm. It's a little bit wider because it actually can mount 96 tips, 384 tips. It can swap between these on the fly. Um, and you can also pick up rows and columns to pipette with those. And off on the edge of this particular example, you'll see another TCAN reader. Um, so a lot of options here. Um, and recently, we have introduced our new Fluent Laboratory Automation System in cell-based assays. Uh, these numbers here, the 480, 780, and 1080, actually refer to the area of the instrument. And if you want to find out more about the Fluent system, we did include the uh, Fluent Laboratory Automation Solution cell-based assay brochure as one of the resources. So I would encourage you to download that PDF, take a look, or come check us out at tcan.com slash fluent, and we have videos and all kinds of information there. Um, these platforms all together actually give us a wide range of options from kind of a small footprint with a good amount of flexibility all the way up to some of the bigger systems with a lot of throughput, a lot of capacity, and a lot of flexibility. Uh, this is perhaps where it can get really confusing for the people who are new to automation. If you're just considering your first time how to take a manual process to an automated process, uh, this is where our sales engineers are going to earn a little bit of their money. We would definitely encourage you to uh, reach out to your local sales rep and have them help you consider what actually meets your needs. And you'll start with kind of configuring a system and talking about what your assay or protocol is. Um, and that salesperson will also kind of talk you through more than just what are the bits and bobs that we need to screw onto the system. Uh, there are other considerations that you are really <laughs> responsible for taking a look at ahead of time. Um, the consumables, the reagent containers, what are you going to put your fluids in at the start, um, to, of course, the instrumentation itself. And then there's also a lot of considerations at the back end as far as what's going to happen with the data. So with TCAN readers, we not only can go ahead and get some values and read luminescence, fluorescence, or what have you, we can also do some of the data reduction and make sure your data flow is covered as well. So it's really not just put samples on an instrument, press go. It's considering the whole workflow in your lab from samples coming onto the instrument to actually data moving downstream. Um, we have actually done a lot of this type of work with partners. And I want to talk you through the considerations we make as a company as we start trying to put together a system. So those practical considerations that you have to do in your lab, we're also doing ourselves on a pretty consistent basis. So as we are trying to kind of pay attention to where markets are moving and what assays are exciting, we're also working with partners to deliver some of those. Um, I'm going to talk through a specific next generation sequencing workstation and some of the considerations we made here for this one. Um, but there's actually a wide variety of stuff. Uh, here on labmanager.com, if you just type into the search TCAN mass spec, you can find our uh, system that we dedicated for front end mass spectrometry for the sample preparation. You can see the webinar and the special considerations we made there. 
We also have some information on our PCR systems on labmanager.com. So there's a lot of offerings here. If you're curious about other stuff, go to our website or go ahead and get in touch with one of our uh, sales representatives in your area. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk with you. Um, the first thing we did for the next generation sequencing of workstation was, of course, consider what are the needs of the assay. And so we actually were able to go with a small footprint instrument with an uh, air displacement liquid handling arm. Uh, there's a shelf in the back for some additional storage of tips, and the robotic gripper arm can take those tips out so we can actually do a longer walk-away time with the amount of tips that are on the system. Um, some temperature-controlled shakers and some thermal devices. Um, and one of the things that actually we have found in the last couple of years becoming increasingly important is this touch interface on the right. Um, as we, the next step after configuring the system, once we identify what an assay needs, uh, is as far as what hardware pieces are needed to actually execute the steps, is to actually really make some considerations on what is the operator going to interact with on a daily basis? Um, what are they going to have to do with the instrument? And what information are they going to have to type in? Are they going to have to give a sample count or a target concentration or a, tar a target amount of volume, that type of thing? Um, and so we've got a dedicated operator interface. We call it Touch Tools. Um, and it's a uh, it's an intuitive uh, uh, interface. We actually have had a lot of fun at trade shows with people who've never seen it before and inviting them to come up to the instruments and just say, press go, see if you can do it. Um, and we've got some special commands that allow you to do things like uh, embed your SOPs right into the assay. This screen here is just one example. If you just do a typical program in EvoWare, uh, and you ask the operator for some variables, and you can read these here, how many samples, how much reagent in microliters. Um, it doesn't require a lot of explanation on how to change these values before moving on in the assay. And that's really the goal here. The people who are pressing go on a daily basis, you generally don't want to have to train them at a level where they are automation experts. And you might find that you have operator turnover, and so you want to make sure that new operators can get up to speed quickly on the daily activities in your lab. Or you'll find you have a variety of operators working on a variety of instrumentation, and there's not really time to dedicate a single person to just the ex daily execution of a single instrument. And so the operator interface is increasingly important for that. Um, the, uh, one of the major trends, of course, is the smartphone we all carry in our pocket. Whether you have an Apple device or an Android device, it's really making the expectation of interacting with a computer um, such that you could just do it with a finger and it doesn't require excessive amounts of training or capability. Um, and so we really focused on the daily operation to make sure that our daily operation of our instrumentation is that easy. Um, so we also have some specific commands that allow you to uh, put your laboratory's SOPs directly into the run. So you can actually show pictures and give a little bit of text next to it. And I've got some examples from the next-gen sequencing coming up. Um, and the other thing you can do is you can use those same techniques, showing pictures with commands to help your operators with their uh, daily maintenance. So you can give a visual of what's going on. If there's a vacuum pump they need to turn off at the end of the run or turn on at the start of the run, you can show a picture of exactly where that instrument is and exactly where that switch is. Uh, and if your operators are consistently following your operating procedures and executing your maintenance, you can have a lot more faith in the consistency of your data, kind of fulfill that promise of automation, which is, reduce the variability in the lab. It does require consistent operation to achieve that. Um, so in kind of taking these general concepts uh, and applying them to next generation sequencing, we worked with our partners to identify some protocols. And that's the script on the left. We actually have several protocols that have been qualified. And uh, the operator can walk up and start any one of those just with a single click. And then on the right, we have a simple screen that shows where they are in the process. and uh, as the essay gets going, every piece of automation does require some manual steps of interaction, um, whether it's putting disposable tips on the work table, putting the labware in the right places, this type of thing. We have some visual instructions that can really help make sure that they do that. And on the right here, we have a selection confirmation screen where we're actually giving the operator one last time to see how it's supposed to look and what they entered. Uh, the other great thing about this is this is all based in the scripting language in EvoWare, which is very easy to edit.
this means if your operators don't need this much help, you can simply take some script lines out and they won't see these. Or if you feel like your operators need a little bit more help, you can put a couple more commands in. The other thing is these are dynamic. Um, instead of it just being a piece of paper that's printed out and sitting next to the instrument that says, if you have 96 samples, put 50 microliters of reagent in uh, this well of this plate, you can actually respond to what the user put in and only show them the instructions that they need. So there's none of the skip to line 17 if not doing this step. You actually would only show the instructions uh, within the run, and you'll show them with every run. Um, the uh, Let's go on. Um, for those of you who are specifically interested in next generation sequencing, uh, I do want to be careful to point out that we don't just focus on the library prep. We actually cover a wide range of the workflow. Uh, we do do we have a wizard for the nucleic acid purification. Um, we also have some dedicated wizards for the quantification, uh, quantitation and normalization. Um, and these are these do integrate TCAN readers and they do automated. Uh, work lists for the normalization, and these get generated on the fly based on what the readers pull in. And we can also do the PCR setup with the PCR wizard. There is more information on this particular wizard on uh, Lab Manager, uh, and of course also on our website. The uh, really great thing about this wizard is, again, it really demonstrates our focus on the operator. There's a lot of steps that are consistent, where the, where the diluents go, where the reagents go, where the primers go. Um, and there's a lot of things that can be variable. The operator might be in your lab able to pick which master mix goes with which sample, and we've got a really colorful, easy-to-use touchscreen for that. Um, we also have automated barcode reading options, but for those who are kind of considering some of the lower end of automation or trying to save costs, we can also work with handheld barcode scanners. And so that can be very important for maybe scanning in uh, lot reagents, for tube barcodes, plate barcodes, we can actually deal with a lot of different ways to get those barcodes into the system and then also report them out in the results that are generated at the end. Um, so I hope that this gave you, uh, by talking through some of the considerations we made for the next generation sequencing, it gave you some of the uh, ideas of what we consider those practical considerations that you need when you're considering adopting auto, uh, automation, whether it's your first system in your lab or whether it's bringing a new assay onto an automated platform that you haven't done yet. Uh, we really do believe firmly that it's very important to think about that daily use, and that actually is something you should do at the initial time that you're deciding what to do with automation because that can influence actually the entire system and how you write your protocols. Um, so this one-touch selection of protocols and step-by-step -step user instruction can reduce training needs. Um, the other thing that we've done as a company is we've worked with our partner, Illumina, here to create qualified protocols, and these are going to be the actions that occur every single time. And these are also the parameters that execute the liquid classes. So if you were looking for next-generation sequencing, we would provide those parameters, and these are protocols qualified by Illumina. And uh, as mentioned on the last slide, we, of course, do more than just library prep. We can cover all these other steps as well. So I hope that this was a little bit insightful, and thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you, Hal. And just a reminder to our uh, viewers that uh, all of our speakers today provide additional resources, and these can be accessed through the resource widget, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Our final speaker of the day joins us today from LabSite. Alyssa Morales is a senior product manager at LabSite. She has worked in the life science industry at companies including GE Healthcare, Kaigen, and Applied Biosystems. Alyssa has a BA in molecular biology and an MA in genetics from Smith College. Thank you for joining us today, Alyssa. Hi, everyone. Thank you um, for listening today. As mentioned, um, my name is Elisa Morales. I'm a se pro senior product manager at LabSite. Today I'm going to be talking about using acoustics in the laboratory setting for your liquid handling needs. <coughs> so as on the theme of today's presentation, um, a lot of the labs are looking to either move into automation or transition to the new automation. There are several things that you may want to consider when you're looking at automation, including increasing your laboratory capacity. You may be wanting to minimize reagent use to save costs, or you might be 
interested in improving data quality and repeatability. As you dig further into those considerations, you, for, you might want to, um, again, look at when you're increasing lab capacity, look at the, the throughput of the instrument. Is the instrument scalable? Other questions may be the flexibility of the system to manage different plate configurations and fluid types. This may be particularly important if you're bringing um, samples in from multiple labs into one, um, one, into one laboratory. Minimizing reagent use. This, looking at this, again, will help you save with costs, but you have to consider the ability of the platform itself to miniaturize the assays. And if you can miniaturize, you af also have to look at whether the assay readers downstream will be able to support those miniaturized assays. For decreasing expenditure in the lab, um, one way to do that is eliminating TIPS, and I'll be talking about that today. And again, approving data quality, this is particularly important if you start looking at miniaturization, as you want to look at an instrument that is a highly precise instrument, as again, as you get down to those lower volumes, they will affect your assays. At LabSite, we create liquid handlers that use acoustic energy. We have several different models that address different throughput needs. Each instrument uses acoustic energy to transfer both aqueous-based solutions, like master mixes, or nucleic acids, and also DMSL. We do this and have this very um, flexibility because we use dynamic fluid analysis for each instrument run, we do a real-time assessment of the fluid, determine what power is needed to move that fluid out of the source plate into your assay plate. And as also for scalability, the instrument can be used alone, and as your lab needs grow, you can integrate it into either a lab site um, robot, automation robot, or into third-party integrators. So acoustic technology works a little bit differently than your tip-based technology. <coughs> if you look inside of the instrument, what happens during a run is you have a source plate which is um, sitting, um, sitting on the bottom, and then inverted is the assay plate which be collecting the sample that you transfer. During the run, a transducer moves around the plate. Again, using DFA determines the power needed, and then the sample is then ejected in either a 2.5 nanoliter or 25 nanoliter drop, and that, those drop sizes are determined by the model of instrument. As the instrument gets transferred to the assay plate, surface tension keeps the drop from falling out of the inverted plate. The instrument then repeats that action between two to 500 drops per second until your desired fill volume is reached. The benefits of this is there's no physical contact. You eliminate washing steps. You don't have to worry about carry, potential carryover from tips. And also there's no, no loss of potential to lose sample that are sticking to the sides of tips. Also, because we're using nanoliter volumes, you're able to get, miniaturize your assays, which would save your lab a lot of money. And flexibility, because we use a single transducer, you're able to move create very flexible plate maps. We transfer any well to any well. Also, because of the DFA, we can, you can mix sample types and within the same plate. As I mentioned, the axis can be used, sorry, the echo can be used alone or with um, an automated robot. LabSite has an access workstation. It's a compact um, footprint that's very modular, so you can um, increase the capacity as you grow. You can have one echo on um, an access, two echoes. You can include in, uh, readers. You can include um, sealers, et cetera, to, again, to address your laboratory's workflow needs. So again, the theme of today's talks is how do you integrate these automation into your labs? So I wanted to give a few examples of how the echo can be integrated into a, a standard workflow, and also the effects it can have on your, um, on your throughput and the cost. <coughs> As I mentioned, uh, the ECHO can be used for both aqueous-based and uh, DMSO. Um, for genomic applications, we have, we, have applica we have protocols for genotyping, gene expression. For proteomics, bio we can use biochemical assays. You can use it for protein crystallography. 
for cellular assays, high content screening assays, cell signaling assays, and then again for DMSO, um, use it for compound screening. Here's an example of a, a gene expression assay. Um, everything in gray uh, would be the, the, the pre-CDNA preparation. And where the echo fits in is it can transfer the cDNA, their master mixes, as well as the primer and probes. Then you can move it in your qPCR machine and then move into analysis. When looking at a conventional workflow versus a miniaturized echo workflow, your total volume you can bring down to about 1.6 microliters, which is a 6x reduction in your reagents, which is about 84% cost savings. And you also can greatly reduce your cDNA from 2 mi microliters down to 30 nanoliters, which can help you uh, maintain precious sample and cut the amount of time you have to repeat um, creating more cDNA. So again, moving into this miniaturization can greatly affect um, your lab's uh, cost and then the workflows. Another example, this is more in the drug discovery realm, would be HTRF assays. In this example, we're looking at, this is an HTRF assay used for cyclic AMP studies. You would use, add the cells with a bulk filler, and then you'd move it into the echo, where you could plate the compounds, as well as add the reagents using the machine. Moving these into miniaturizations have a couple effects. One of them, again, is um, reduction, a 10x reduction, and which will help you about 90% cost savings. Also, you can use a lot less cells. In this example, the conventional is five microliters. You can bring that down to one microliter. And the biggest aspect here is the compound itself. You can move it to 10 nanoliters of compound. And what that does is it drops the final concentration in the DMSO, which of course can um, give you better results in your assays. Uh, moving into more of the ADME talks world, um, there's another example of how um, the ECHO fits into the workflow. Again, the ECHO can be used for the compound, compound plating, but it can also be used in the addition of the HML, the HML cells, the human liver microsomes. Again, there's, again, you would have, this would allow you to have significant cost reduction, allow you to have um, a lot less DMSO in your assay. But the other interesting aspect of using the ECHO for this type of an assay is you can remove an entire step out of the assay. In the conventional TDI assays, you have to do an additional aliquot step because the volumes are too great for a three to four well plate. When you move into miniaturization, you re remove that step completely because you're using nanoliter volumes. So you can just make the assay and then move into the analysis. The final example is moving, um, it's still in the drug discovery realm, but it's looking at kinase act profiling. Um, you know, these assays are typically used to look at the effect of compounds on the kinase activity. This particular example is using the Promega ADP GLOW, so looking at the ADP, um, the effects of AD, uh, on the compounds on the ADP. Um, again, plating the kinase would be off in a bulk filler. Then you can actually um, combine the entire, build the entire uh, assay using the echo and then move into analysis. And again, as with all the other examples, um, you can miniaturize this assay. Uh, we go from a 20 microliter total volume down to a 5 microliter total, which would be a 75% cost savings. You also can use significantly less kinases. In this example, the conventional is 10 microliters. You get down to 2.5 microliters. And with these assays, and there's examples, actually, you can download with three of the assays I described here, um, the, the quality of the assay is the same as the the conventional, again, you're just using a lot less volume, saving you money in the lab. Thank you for uh, listening. And um, again, uh, the echo liquid handlers use acoustic energy. They are highly, we highly, pre we're highly accurate, precise at transferring nanoliter volumes. And we're extremely flexible, both in the plate mapping and the liquids we can use. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and 
Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, I think we'll go uh, straight into our question and answer session. And I believe also joining us today for our Q&A is uh, Bonnie Edwards, who is an application scientist at uh, Agilent Technologies. So uh, the first question that I had uh, uh, has to do with uh, with training for these systems. Um, it, it looks like a lot of them have uh, fairly uh, straightforward uh, uh, operations. Uh, now, is training typically done in lab, or can this be done in demo labs? What's the uh, what's the best option? Kasia, maybe I can start you with that. Uh, sorry, Trevor, can you repeat the question, please? I just had a question about training on these systems. Is that typically done uh, done in lab, or can that be done in demo labs? Uh, so it it, uh, it varies. Uh, we have a number of, I guess, depending on the instruments, we have uh, a various um, um, pre-recorded, whether it's a webinar or movies, that help with some of the trainings as well. A lot of times we do um, do you know on-site training with our customers. Uh, specific to their assay and their needs uh, at the time of, uh, really at the time after the installation so that we can get them up and running uh, in each lab. But uh, if need be on occasion, we have also organized uh, outside training sessions, so that uh, might be arranged at different time as well. Great, thank you. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Uh, well, I was, I was going to say it all. I think it in part depends upon the complexity of what you're trying to automate. I mean, uh, the large automated systems that have been described here, I'm, I'm sure that the amount of training necessary is is uh, fairly substantial. Um, we biotech manufactures mostly kind of small standalone systems where, I mean, it's it's almost always done in the lab with either a a demo situation or uh, at, at time of installation. So, but on the other hand, it's, these are markedly less complex systems than some of the stuff that was described earlier today. Uh, I'd like to jump in just as the counterpoint. This is Hal with TCAN, um, which actually does have the larger systems that can integrate washers and stuff. Um, we actually do offer, with every system we install, on-site training of the operators for things like the system care and safety. Um, we also have an online training pr uh, program called TCAN Academy um, so that you can actually get certified uh, certification for your operators. Um, and then for those uh, customers who are interested in really learning the full depth of our uh, software and system capabilities, we also have training centers uh, in the U.S. and in Europe where we uh, will offer uh, multi-day training sessions. And we can also sometimes offer these on-site for customers where we will teach uh, the wide breadth of what the software can do and also get into some of the really uh, fine details of liquid um, liquid handling as well as far as the parameterization of a liquid class. Um, so it kind of goes from the small training to the big training depending on the needs. And this is Elisa. I'll uh, chime in too for lab site, Lisa Morales lab site. We also offer um, on-site training. It's typically about half of a day. However, a lot of customers do approach us um, as miniaturization gets uh, more popular to try it. They want to miniaturize uh, assays that may not have been miniaturized yet in any other lab. So we typically will go in, work with them in a demo, um, and start um, working with their workflows to get the right, um, the, just make sure we have the right liquid classes and they're comfortable with the instrument. And then one, if they do buy the instrument, then again we train them formally after the uh, purchase. Great, thank you. Uh, now we have a question about uh, handling uh, sort of difficult fluids, viscous fluids and gels. Can all these systems uh, dispense uh, dispense viscous fluids and gels? And uh, maybe I'll start uh, start with you, uh, Alyssa. Yours, uh, it, it interests me the most, I think. Alyssa, are you still there? Yes, hi. Um, the ECHO um, does not necessarily transfer gels. We do transfer liquids. We, for example, have transferred up to 50% glycerol viscosity. Again, as the liquid gets more viscous, we would go in with the demo and start working with the um, reagent to see how successful it can be. And I can tell you here as well. 
Uh, Absolutely. Hi, this is Kasha. Kasha from Agilent. Um, so on our systems, we have uh, pipetting techniques when you can really control. You have quite a bit of control in terms of the, the speed of aspiration or dispense and any air gaps you might want to set. So uh, you can uh, also, you know, you can manage that when you have more viscous fluids. Uh, probably wouldn't be able to do gels. But I think in terms of difference in viscosity and differences in fluids, you can control that um, with the um, the various controls that, that uh, you were able to set in the pipetting technique. Um, Hal here from TCAN, if I can jump in on this one as well. Um, of course, it really does depend on what you mean by viscous. Um, and also, it depends a lot on what, what is the robustness of the assay, and by that I mean what type of accuracy and precision are you willing to accept. Um, that will sometimes open up what we are able to do. TCAN hardware-wise offers a wide variety of um, tip options. We've got a wide range of plastics for disposable tips, including some wide bore options, uh, and we also have the ability to do a wide variety of fixed tips on our liquid-filled uh, liquid handling arm. And these six tips can also sometimes open up uh, new and interesting possibilities depending on what the precise goals are. Uh, and this is, again, one of those times that I'd say, make our sales engineers earn their money. Go ahead and give them some challenges. Yeah, th this Thank is you. Paul at Biotech. Uh, we've, we've, we've basically ac accomplished things uh, in a similar fashion. <clears throat> With the, the multifold that I talked about earlier today, it's got a number of different uh, dispensers uh, in they're more or less calibrated depending on what type they are. The peri pump dispensers are, in, in essence, calibrated by the, the uh, autoclavable cassette. Uh, so a, a viscous solution would, would require a slightly different calibration uh, that the end user can do uh, than, say, a, a, an aqueous solution. We've done uh, things as, as dissimilar as a hot auger, uh, anywhere from hot auger to you know, DMSO or even uh, aqueous solution. Just a matter of uh, calibrating the cassette accordingly. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, uh, I'll again start with uh, Alyssa on this one. Uh, what is the uh, the throughput of the uh, your Echo Liquid Handler, and uh, how does the speed compare with uh, with a tip system? Um, it depends on the volume and the liquid. Um, again, 200 to 500 drops per um, per second. Um, again, that also depends on the, on the model. The 555 does the 5 nanoliter is uh, one of our fastest instruments. The 525 also is quick and does 25 nanoliters. So that tends to be used more for your genomics assays. And the 525 also has a bulk buffer chamber, and again, uh, 2 to 500 seconds. Um, we do have on our website specifications um, for various uh, liquid classes that we have on the instrument and um, the, the speed. Great, thank you. Uh, any other uh, any other comments there as far as uh, um, high throughput needs and uh... Uh, yeah, I, I would just kind of want to come to her defense a little bit and say perhaps the question is a little bit unfair to compare what the ECHO can do to what a tip-based system like uh, what the TCAN platforms can do because, of course, we can pipette eight wells at once and at the larger volumes our speeds are going to be much faster and that's on the liquid handling arm. We also have the ability to pipette uh, even sub-microliter ranges with our 384 channel head, so you could do an entire plate at once if you were looking at doing something like a reagent distribution. Uh, it would, of course, be more appropriate to choose something like the MCA 384 on, a, on an EVO. Um, and so as far as the high throughput goes, if you're really talking about the quantity of plates going through a system, it really comes down to the assays. Um, you know, on a tip-bit system like ours, you, you have the ability to have different arms executing different functions. You could have the uh, liquid handling arm, pipetting from samples to plates, and while plate one is going downstream, plate two can have its samples pipetted while the MCA is pipetting plate one's reagents. So it is a, a little bit of a different game, and it depends a lot on the assays. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question I had was, uh, how easy is it to uh, to reconfigure your your hardware and software uh, for multiple assays, or if your assay type is going to 
happens to change. I'm happy to take that. So if I can. Certainly. Okay. okay, so Kasha here from Agilent. Uh, as I mentioned during my talk, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of flexibility with both our Bravo system and the Encores. Uh, obviously, you'd uh, need to um, have a new protocol, whether it's a pre-written or, you know, if you're writing a new protocol. Uh, we do have a one-touch teach with our, our robotic arm on the Encore. As I showed you in the photos, there's an arm that can, that's built into the system and it can reach off deck. So that makes it easier to, to try to teach the robot positions uh, if you're trying to um, integrate with another device or grab the plate from somewhere else. Um, so it's, I'd say there's quite a bit of flexibility in there, uh, but you would have to um, you know, test a new protocol. Again, the 3D simulation comes in handy for that. And, uh, um, yeah, I think you can adjust it um, and run with different things. Um, and I think uh, with TCAN we have a similar uh, philosophy as Agilent as far as if you look at the systems. Um, but this is actually what I would say is one of TCAN's greatest strengths. Um, when I was in the field, that was one of the things I did the most was an instrument that had been in the field for one or two years. The customer decided they wanted to bring on a new assay that required a new device or different carriers. And on an Evo, you can literally just slide a carrier off the work table and slide a new one on. It's something that could even happen on a daily basis if you had different carriers for different needs. But we also have a lot of integration options. We have our robotic gripper arm, which can integrate devices in the back on the side, or you can even cut a hole in the work table and integrate devices underneath the work table. So we also have our TCANs reader and washers that we're very proud of that you can integrate. But we're also a little bit device agnostic. Uh, if you have a third-party device that you love, if you love your biotech washer and you need it for your assay, that's actually something that we could integrate right on our system, and it's something you could do after purchase. It's something that two years down the line, it wouldn't be a problem to have us come in and help you integrate that one thing you need for the next assay or for the next idea. Hey, thank you. Hi, this is Elisa. This is that yes. website. Uh, to answer that question also, for the Echoes, um, you don't have to change hardware and there's no user calibrations. Because of the dynamic fluid analysis, you can have multiple different um, reagents in the same plate. And you do not have to change anything to move your liquid. Your destination plates can be 1536, 384, 96 well. Again, it's just telling the machine what you have. And then again, the machine with the dynamic fluid analysis will do the proper adjustments to transfer that liquid into the inverted assay plate. Hey, thank you. Paul, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just I'm kind of struggling as how to answer the, a question. <laughs> You're question was more directed, I think, towards uh, automated systems as compared to what we have is really a, in many instances, would be considered a component to that automated system. Uh, the component, the multi-flow is, you know, it's in essence a strip machine uh, that handles up one plate at a time. Uh, certainly it's easily configured with in terms of changing manifolds for changing plate types. Uh, and programming is, 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 is as simple as telling it you've got a different manifold or a different plate type. Uh, so ch making changes on the multiflow would be markedly, uh, I think, simpler than changing um, uh, a whole process on an EVO, as an example. Great, thank you. Uh, now, can, or do these uh, systems have options to work on customized plates, and can they work on, uh, on all formats? Um, from TCAN, our, our short answer is yeah. yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it, we, uh, we do supply um, definitions for a wide range of labware from 6-well up to 1536-well. And we also have a, a bunch of tubes that we give default definitions for. But our software can also accommodate if you wanted to literally duct tape a Dixie cup to your work table, we could also model that and aspirate and handle that as well. So customization of labware is also something that we can do very easily and very well. Yeah, same here. So this is uh, Kasha from Agilent. Uh, we also have the option to customize your lab work. So we've uh, uh, played with various, um, um, whether it be tube holders or um, you know various plates. We have uh, definitions of of a lot of the um, 
Labor that's out there already, we have that pre-configured on the system, but if you want to make something that's, that's customized, then you can definitely um, set that up on the system. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other comments? Uh, this is Paul Batik. I was going yeah. to reiterate the same, the same thing. We've got the, the instruments have a, a fair amount of um, adjustability within uh, offsets and things like that that, you, that you're going to accommodate you know, not only standard uh, play formats, but even kind of uh, off-standard uh, formats in terms of uh, you know, uh, offsets and uh, height adjustments, things like that. Great. Thank you very much. Lisa, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> but for the echoes, um, we also can do custom labware definitions for the destination plates. Um, SBS format, we also um, can, uh, customers also use things like slides and arrays. Great, thank you. Well, as I look at the clock, I realize we're running low on time. Uh, I do have a few more questions that uh, are, are more instrument specific, so I'm going to forward them to, uh, uh, to our speakers uh, and they'll get back to you directly. So this brings us to the end of today's webinar. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the panelists directly as they are the true experts in the field. The contact information, as you can see, is available on the screen now. Just a reminder that today's webinar video will be available at the link you see on the screen. On behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank our panelists today for their hard work that they put into their presentations. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Biotech, Agilent Technologies, TCAN, and LabSite for supporting our Tech Trends webinar series. As well, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. You may wish to join us uh, for our next uh, Tech Trends webinar which focuses on developments in microplate technology. This webinar will be taking place Thursday, October 16th from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. For more information, please visit our website at www.labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again next time. Thank you.